Hello friends, I'm Kayla. Exactly four years ago, September 2019, I did a video called Reading Like a Visco Girl. Visco or VSEO is a social media app that still exists today. And there was a teen girl aesthetic making the rounds and the girls who embodied that were coined Visco Girls. It was very popular on the app. It was represented by a beach lifestyle and jeeps and scrunchies and a certain bag and certain shoes and hydro flasks, puka shell necklaces, oversized tees and what have you. And I wanted to see, because it was kind of a trend around the time people were doing videos about Visco girls and I wanted to see what the Visco girls were reading. So I scoured their socials and I read their favorite books. There was a lot of YA romance naturally that I had actually already read. Uh, there was a lot of nonfiction, there was poetry. It was a really fun and enlightening time. We checked out out Emma and Haley, Ellie, Hannah, Summer, Ava, Marla, Melanie. And I figured four years later, because some of them have bookish content now, let's see what they're reading now. I haven't prepared for this very much, so the first chunk of this video is going to be going again on their socials, seeing what books they're talking about. And the only bit of prep work I did is I skimmed through hours of Emma Chamberlain's um, podcast because I heard that she talks about books occasionally on there. So if you look at her channel, there was a time a couple years ago where she got into some book stuff. I know this because I keep up with Emma's content. I remember there being one called Reading Makes You Hot where she was encouraging everybody to read books. She also has a podcast about like why we need to read more. I don't remember what she's reading in this video, but we're gonna find out together. Oh, didn't see there. I was... <sighs> reading. Okay. That's East of Eden. <laughs> That's a big book. Watch me like accidentally like fall in love with books. She also has an Instagram post from that same time with East of Eden in the background. Fun fact, I do own East of Eden, but I haven't read it. So why not? Let me grab it. This collection of books is truly my favorite thing. I think they're so beautiful. And the biggest one down here is East of Eden. Side note, this isn't about reading favorites. Like I don't wanna find proof of them listing their favorite books. I just wanna pick books that I see like on their Instagram, on their YouTube. The podcast episode I was listening to was April, 2021, which does align with this. And she was talking about how she wants to be a reader. She hasn't finished a book in four years. And I guess this is the book that she had taken with her to the beach. She said she read the first chapter, had to reread it because she wasn't used to reading and then got 30 pages in by the time she left the beach. She also has a video called Bed and the thumbnail has her reading. It looks to me like it's called The Razor's Edge. I've been reading the same book for like three months and I haven't finished it yet. And then the one she mentioned in the podcast was called Poison for Breakfast by Lemony Snicket. So we can just hear her pitch it. If you're getting into reading and you don't know where to start, but you just wanna read something, I would recommend the book Poison for Breakfast by, I think it's by Lemony Snicket. I too was reading Daniel Handler in my early 20s. So I'll pick this one up, even though it's not something that I would probably read current day. We've gotten three from Emma and now we're gonna move over to Summer McKean. She is also the host of a podcast. So maybe there's something in there somewhere, but let's just see. A lot of beverage promotion for sure. Maybe I need to drink like a Visco girl or a former Visco girl. Is that a book? Okay, that must be a magazine. Okay, I found something on her TikTok. If you have social media, which you do, I want you to listen to this. Many of today's most popular apps actively encourage users to judge one another. I love that she's actively reading to us. What's particularly weird is that we don't just care about other people's judgments, we ask for them. We post photos and comments to show others that we're lovable and we're popular and on a more existential level that we matter. And then we check our phones obsessively to see if other people or at least their online profiles agree. How to break up with your phone. Okay. It definitely makes sense for somebody on social media to have an awareness about social media. I love that. How damaging and harmful it can be for you. You've also got a what's in my bag. It looks like there's a lot in it. I bring my book. Part of 75 hard, you have to read 10 pages a day. The subtle art of not giving up. Wait. And it's really, really good sometimes. Okay, that's so funny because if you saw the original episode, she got that for Christmas and I read it in that video because she held it up. I enjoyed it. I gave it, I think, a 3.5. So it's so fun to see four years later, now she's reading it. Okay, now we'll move on to Ava. And when I was pulling up all of their social media last night, I saw that she actually just did a book video. When I don't see that she's done one in a while, I'm just going to scrub through this and we're gonna see the titles of everything. Then when I pick one, I can go back and listen to the full pitch of it. The first one I see is The Housemaid, 
and I guess the sequel I didn't even know it had a sequel I think this book has been making its way around book talk I'm feeling there's gonna be some romance and I would rather not lean towards romance if I don't have to we've got something called a thousand boy kisses oh then she was gone by Lisa Jewell I did not like that one love in other words too late uh, one of my definite least favorite Colleen Hoover's. The Locked Door, that's the same author as The Housemaid. The Inmate, same author. Happy Plays and Never Lie, which is the same mystery author. Okay, so I'm gonna leave with the recommendation of The Housemaid. I think when it started gaining popularity, I just thought it was the same book as The Maid, but just with a different cover. The Housemaid follows the story of this woman named Millie who has a criminal record, a criminal past. She lands this housemaid opportunity for this very wealthy family. Both Millie the employee and the employer the Winchester I think yeah Winchester family all have a lot of secrets oh and she has a whole book shelf with things on it a lot of books I didn't love a lot of popular things for sure we've got Taylor Jenkins Reid Silent Patient some stuff from Holly Jackson cool cool let's move on to Hannah a lot of absolutely beautiful locations oh here's one with a book the caption says some light reading. A wooden boat magazine. We've got letters to my younger self. That's interesting. A um, hundred inspiring people on the moments that shaped their lives. There is a tiny sliver of a book um, that maybe it was just thrown in to be a part of the picture and it was somebody else's or it was just a book at the vacation spot that they're staying. Um, but it says John Medina. That's a nonfiction author. Let's see if we can figure out exactly which one it is. Brain Rules for Aging Well just has the red font at the bottom and that matches up. Definitely not a very clear recommendation or anything, but there is that. And I think that's all I see. Let's move on to Ellie. She doesn't seem to really run her Instagram um, like lifestyle-y. It's mostly fashion in her career and she is holding a magazine that she's in. So I don't expect to see any books on here, but I also know that she is active on TikTok. Oh, I just saw books. That went by so quickly. Hold on, I think that was Colleen Hoover again. Yeah, also reading Too Late by Colleen Hoover. I'm just happy the girls are reading. I'm not gonna be reading a Colleen Hoover. And that's fine. Let's move on to Marla Catherine. Do we see any books? Let's find out. Ooh, there's a scrapbook. Magazines. Gone with the Wind. I don't think that's a read. I think that was purchased to cut up for said scrapbook. Oh, here's one that may be a study Bible. In the original video, what was most successful for me was scouring um, room tours. So maybe that's the answer here. Okay, I found one bookshelf shot. I see the book Thief, which I've read, and I see the selection, which I've read. Better than the movies. The Alchemist? I have never read The Alchemist. And I think that's all I can see. Now we'll go over to Melanie. Most of her content is thrifting related. But again, there is a couple moments where we can spot a bookshelf in the distance. I see Happy Plays. I see a Colleen Hoover, American Roommate Experiment, some Sally Rooney, John Green, lots of Taylor Jenkins read. I've read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and did not like it, but everybody else does. And so it makes me think I shouldn't read more from that author. Maybe I should. I also saw Ava reading Taylor Jenkins read in one of her posts. Oh, here's one. Prime student she did a partnership with and there's the secret history which i've read normal people which i read orbiting jupiter which i read and loved but then we have everything i know about all of this stuff by dolly alderton um, which i've seen around and 101 essays that will change the way you i think it's live or think about life or something like that here's what i'm noticing right now is this list is even whiter than like in 2019 we had a list with Lauren Conrad and the Book of Mormon on it. I do feel like I'm struggling to diversify the selection of books so we're gonna head over to Haley. She is a book influencer. Here's her with a pile of books. That's not necessarily what I'm looking for. She's reading one for my enemy in this picture. Um, I mean that would add a little bit to the TBR. Should I just do that? <laughs> Half of the Atlas 6 I didn't love it, but I could give that author another go. Maybe I'll scroll through like a favorites video list. What would we have to choose from here? Okay, I've read that. Okay, okay. Oh, there we've got Taylor Jenkins Reid. 
One True Loves. I feel like that has become a movie recently, if I'm thinking about the right one. I know I said I wasn't going to read romance. This has a lot of romance on it. I feel like one romance of the whole thing is good. Uh, yeah, to keep any kind of variety in here, I'm just going to go with the Olive E. Blake. I have a good amount of things to choose from, which is exciting. I think aesthetically speaking, things that I noticed along the way, the former Visco girl has traded in the scrunchies for the hair clips, the claw clips. I saw Hydro Flasks become Stanleys. They've traded in the Fial Raven Konkin for tote bags. They've traded in the oversized casual shirts for a lot of like crochet and knitwear and the puka shells for more like elegant jewelry. In fact, some of them even run their own jewelry businesses apparently. So these ladies are podcast hosts, business owners, models. They're on the front of magazines. They're doing so much fun stuff. So I'm going to gather a selection of books that I saw around the former Visco Girls pages and I'm going to read some of them and just let you know my thoughts. <laughs> All right, big success on the book front. I found everything that I was looking for. So the 11 things I'm gonna try out this week. Last time I did reading like a Visco Girl for a week. This feels like more than a week's worth of a TBR. We've got nonfiction, self-help if you will, some classic reads. Then we've got a fantasy romance, a contemporary romance, a mystery and whatever this is. Today I feel like my vibe is manifesting Haley Pham with the initial necklace and since I recently read and loved this fantasy Shakespeare modern retelling Immortal Longings which isn't actually getting fantastic reviews, I think a more beloved fantasy modern Shakespeare retelling A Romeo and Juliet might work as well. So I did start one for my enemy this morning. I have a couple tabs because I'm just kicking my little feet having a great time. But another reason I'm starting here is because I need something to read in tandem with this because I did start this last night and I am already struggling through it and so I figure if I read this alongside something fun that'll make the experience better. Um, something about this is I went to buy it and it was wrapped in plastic which I find very odd but I cracked it open and I read the first couple essays, the first seven it seems. And what I will say about this is it's very accessible. Like it's something that you could easily pick up and put down and just read one essay at a time. They don't really string together besides the idea that like you need to change your perspective to be happy in life. Many of them so far though are just lists. So you can just flip it open and read 16 signs of a socially intelligent person and then put it down, pick it up the next day. Let's sit down actually. I'll give you my first impressions because I'm obviously not going to go through every single essay and review it. But I do think that that one might indicate how my overall all feelings of this are going to be. Basically the ability to communicate effectively is obviously something that she sees people struggle with so she wanted to give examples of what people who effectively communicate do successfully. I put pink post-its where I think she made an especially good point. If it didn't have a post-it it's just like whatever um, but the green post-its are ones that gave me pause a little bit. So an example of a socially intelligent person is they don't immediately deny criticism. Another one I really liked is they listen to hear not respond but then there's ones that say like they recognize that their shadow selves are the traits, behaviors, and patterns that aggravate them about others. And I just think it's a really weird implication to say that if I don't like something in the world, that it's a reflection of myself. It says, if you genuinely disliked something, you would disengage with it. And I just don't think that that's true. And maybe that's like my type eight or airy self, but say I'm encountering workplace injustice, or I hear somebody else experiencing prejudice and I have an emotional response to it and I feel a need to call them out or call them in. I feel like she's saying that that's bad and that I need to do some internal reflection about why I dislike that thing. And I get that my examples are not her intent, but when she's giving just like such a tiny paragraph and a broad generalization, then I also can give a broad generalization about the essay back. In essay seven, what the feelings you most suppress are trying to tell you, she said something about suffering. What you have to know is that suffering is just the refusal to accept what is. That's it. Perhaps her idea of suffering is different than somebody else's because I don't know if it's too bold of me to say, but I don't think it's realistic to say if you change your mindset, you will no longer be suffering as a fact. For many, many people in many, many situations, that is not true. And now I feel like a disclaimer is needed that I want everyone to understand and that I understand these were not recommendations. <laughs> these two specifically and why I want to start here also is that these were not even like given a rating or a review. I just saw them and I took them. So please do not interpret my like or dislike of any of these books as a personal opinion or critique on actual human people. 
Anyway, I'm gonna continue reading this one today because I'm having a good time and I'll check in with you about what it's about in a little bit. And I'm probably gonna spend most of my day um, resisting a reread of Romeo and Juliet because I do know it's on my shelves somewhere. But maybe that is the right thing to do because when I was reading Immortal Longings, I did stop and read Antony and Cleopatra and I think it made my experience better. And any reason to crack up this collection, I'm probably gonna take. I haven't reread Romeo and Juliet since high school, so maybe I should so I can like get all of the little nods that I might otherwise have missed. We're at the park, came here to play tennis and then realized that the tennis courts that they have here are not for the public. I did end up reading Romeo and Juliet and I'm giving it like four stars. I feel like if I hadn't read um, Macbeth, Hamlet, A Midsummer Night's Dream and Antony and Cleopatra like within the last year, I probably would have rated this a five, but it's so glaringly obvious that it's not as good. So that's interesting to know. Um, it's a lot more rhymy than any of the ones that I've read recently. So we have the two rival families and when Romeo and Juliet or their names in here, there's like a character with the name that's similar to Romeo, but he's not the one who I think is into our Juliet. So that's interesting. So we've got Lev who is talking right now to Alexandra or she goes by um, Sasha. And when they meet, just like the characters in here, they don't know that the other is from that rival family. They immediately figure out who each other are, learn each other's last names and they're like, oh, we shouldn't be together. One for my enemy, one of them knows before the other and the other one like keeps it kind of a secret because they have ulterior motives. And obviously this is fantasy and um, there's like magic and poisons and they're both witches. And so they don't just go to the apothecary for poison in here they like are the apothecary can i just say nothing is going right for me today like i went to go get a drink because i wanted to get something inspired by Haley, and so she does this series on instagram where she goes to starbucks and she sees their signs that um give zodiac recommendations she gets them for her and her friends and so i went and i tried to order the thing that was for an Aries and they didn't have it. I guess I was out of season, so my bad. It's a new day, I have finished this and I kicked off starting to post uh, pictures of my TBR throughout the week on Instagram so people can like guess what I'm reading, just see what I'm reading. And I realized that I was wearing a similar like cotton gauzy shirt um, that Haley has in this story. So I decided to take a similar picture and post it just like I did four years ago. But a quick review of this one is I'm gonna have to give it I think a three, but maybe below, maybe a 2.75. I really, really wanted to love this. And I have the same feelings as I did with reading the Atlas Six. The language is beautiful. Much like the Atlas Six, it also did a great job of establishing its characters. In fact, too good a job. You're getting to know the different personalities within the family, how they all interact. But then it gets to the point that like every single time someone enters a room, I feel like we have to know who they are and how people feel about them and how people are looking at them. And the dynamics just get so clear and then it just keeps going and keeps going. There was also light magic and I love light magic systems, but there were points where she was explaining something and I didn't fully grasp like what she meant. I was like, can we go back? Can you fully flesh this idea out a little bit better rather than just saying like, this happened because of this, even though we've never seen any evidence of that magical thing happening before. And there's just so many repetitive scenes of meeting with people and having dealings with people. And I just feel the pace is off because of that. I was definitely bored and just kept checking out a lot in the second half. And I'm so sad that this is how things kicked off. I also don't know when I'm gonna continue in the essay collection. Maybe I should just read a couple a day, but right now I wanna read something fun and make myself a coffee. So of course I went ahead and ordered Chamberlain coffee. Now I already have to adjust my expectations because this has come across the border. It did ship surprisingly fast. It didn't get caught up in customs or anything. I'm gonna make it the exact same way that I typically make my Starbucks espresso. I don't have like a fancy machine or anything. First, let's smell this one. Now this one, oh, oh, it smells like um, chocolate. Oh, it is literally, wait. <laughs> Creamy body, dark chocolate, sweet caramel. I believe this is the only espresso that they had. So let's get into it. Here's the thing, no matter how good this is, I'm never ordering it again because it was $40. Now I would say this is definitively darker than my usual. However, this coffee is much lighter than I'm used to. Huh. 
You can tell by my coffee setup, I am not like a professional coffee reviewer or taster, but I think I'm actually gonna pull another shot. Maybe I didn't put enough in. It must have been user error because these grounds are not as fine as I'm used to, so maybe I didn't um, pack it as well. Taste test number two. All right, I don't know. I kept a shot hot so I can try this. I don't know how to review coffee. It tastes, I think, how it's supposed to taste. It just doesn't, it doesn't have any like interesting flavor to me. Wow, I was really hoping for a, a more extreme reaction. Well, the question is, does that indicate how this book is gonna go? I'll let you know in a couple pages. Hello, sorry I forgot about you. This new ramen place opened in town and um, it was top five meals of my life. So I finished my book. I actually think Emma, uh, the same person who made that coffee, she read this book. Oh, cool. And I think who she recommended it to was spot on because she said people who haven't read in a while. And I think that's the perfect person to recommend this to because for like so many reasons. If you haven't read in a while and you're young, that means maybe you haven't read since you were reading this age range. And so it's just like comfortable and familiar to get into. It's like direct to reader, which feels very comfortable and familiar. The title Poison for Breakfast is because the book kicks off with Lemony going to have breakfast and there's a note afterwards that says, you just had poison for breakfast. And he spends the entire book recalling all of these experiences and talking to all of these different people, trying to figure out things about life and trying to figure out if he is in fact dying. For somebody who's not an avid reader because of like anxiety, I know a lot of people have a hard time picking up books, especially longer books, because it's hard to be in the quiet and not have constant noise and media going on. I feel like this is great, not just because it's short, but because it actually confronts some of those anxieties. It talks directly about um, death. Many, many more people have died than are living now. So when you die, you will have something in common with the vast majority of human beings. I guess then reason number four would be that it's short stories, which makes it easy to get into. And number five, it's just a book about books and a book about the love of reading and storytelling. I don't know if I have anything to recommend exactly like this, but I would say if you liked this, you might like Before the Coffee Gets Cold. I'm not gonna rate this because it is a children's book and I try not to do that. Today's read is gonna be The Alchemist. I'm excited about this, I've already started, um, because our main character's name is Santiago, which I'm pretty sure is the same main character as Monstrilio, which is my book club pick of the month. And I think there's gonna be a pretty stark contrast between these two characters. So this one um, starts off with basically getting this idea that he needs to travel from Spain to Egypt in search of the pyramids because there's treasure there or there's something to gain. And he keeps interacting with these people and running into different people. And they're talking about how he needs to get to Egypt and how he needs to follow his personal journey or they called it something like that. It's pretty short. It's got a little bit of illustration in here. This is the 25th anniversary edition. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Like the aesthetics right now are fantastic. Today we went to um, Liam's hockey tryouts. So it's two of like four or five that he's gonna go to in the next week to see what team he makes. And then we went to our small town yearly art walk art exhibit and got to see all the local artisans. So that was really fun. We got lunch, now we're home and I am committed to this. It's going by pretty quick. So I might be able to read this and another book today if I wanna get all the reads done by the time I've allotted for this vlog. We'll see how it goes. The sun is setting. I finished The Alchemist. I wanna see what it was written because I thought that this was old, old. <laughs> like just when I originally heard the title um, and people were telling me if I was gonna enjoy a classic, cause historically I don't really love a lot of classics, that it should absolutely be The Alchemist. And I thought this was way older. And yeah, I know that it says 25th anniversary. And so I can do the math, but I didn't know when this edition was printed, but I guess this originally came out in 1984. I don't wanna tell you when I thought this might've been published, but I thought it was like ancient. <laughs> so I am a little surprised to see it has 3 million ratings. So I'm not about to come on here and like talk shit about this book that three million people on Goodreads have rated and most of them super highly. I just thought it was okay. Like, I don't know. It was just okay. And maybe I read a few too many things like this recently. I feel like if this was written a little bit differently, it could have been aged down and I would recommend it alongside Little Prince. I think there's a bunch of takeaways like follow your dreams and um, persevere through everything and overcome all of your obstacles and just continue 
on. Just tr try your hardest. You'll always get what you want if you try hard. And the journey isn't just about the destination. It's about how you get there and all of the things along the way. It definitely got more spiritual and religiously focused as the book went on. The end honestly was not really what I was expecting when there was so much metaphor and allegory within these pages. I just thought the whole idea of him like wanting his treasure at the end would have have more layers to it. And then I do think it's interesting to think about who the author decided in this book would get the opportunity to achieve their own personal legend and who didn't. I'm definitely on the hunt to find something that I love and I think even if I have no takeaways from this, I'm sure I will agree with so many of the things that this book is gonna talk about. So next I'm reading How to Break Up With Your Phone by Katherine Price. I don't personally need to break up with my phone because when I spend time on my phone, it is for work. My free time, I don't just wanna pick up my phone constantly. I'm most excited to just read this and know exactly what's in it. And so I can recommend it to somebody else. It's late, I'm very tired, but I wanna tell you my final thoughts on this. I think first of all, it did a great job of explaining what it was going to explain. So she started it off saying the first half of this book is gonna be like me scaring you into all of these terrible facts about like what screen time and your phone time does to your brain. And the second half is all about like a 30 day um, breaking up with your phone detox kind of thing. And so I guess the reason I don't feel like rating it is because I didn't implement all of the things and I didn't take the 30 days to really do it. And I'm sure if I did, I would come out on the other side with a better relationship with my phone as did the author because that's what she was doing for 30 days was every week there were like certain goals of how much time and what to do. And she was giving all of these tips about like where to put your phone and how to turn off all of your notifications and stuff, just like I thought. She is a health and science journalist and was sharing all of these facts, but she was talking about how the stoppage of things comes naturally to people. You have a natural urge to stop sleeping when it's time to wake up in the morning. You have an urge to stop eating when you're full, but there, because phones aren't natural, you don't have a natural feeling that it's time to stop scrolling. Most of this, I would say, the biggest tip overall is about mindfulness. And instead of just picking up your phone every 10 minutes, think about what you're looking for. Take a moment to think, why do I wanna pick up my phone right now? What emotion or feeling am I hoping to gain from it? If that's what you're looking for, like that hit of dopamine or whatever, and can I get that elsewhere? She said was to change your lock screen to a reminder that you didn't wanna be on your phone. So it says something like, uh, why are you picking me up right now? And overall, I just think it was a quality piece of research and she obviously did all of this herself and gained something good out of it and wanted to share it with everybody and that's great. So I dropped Liam off at school and before I run some errands, I'm gonna have a little beach morning. So I grabbed some books. I don't know what I'm reading yet, but I figured I would sit by the lake and maybe read the first chapter of a couple. So I did bring a few things. I breezed past like anything to do with Marla Catherine and Summer McKean because I read their books yesterday and didn't really do much else. So I figured because the girls both love smoothies, I would grab a smoothie and come to the beach. Um, Marla posts a lot about strawberry drinks. I saw in a recent video, she went to Air One and got the Hailey Bieber one, which is strawberry. Um, I don't have that here. I got the Ocean Mist, which is strawberries and then banana, mango, passion fruit, guava, and collagen. I have my tote with me. This is a new one that I got recently. It says read more books. It's from Indigo. And I brought One True Loves, The Housemaid, and The Razor's Edge. So we'll see what speaks to me. Now the aesthetics might look peaceful, but now you can hear the construction going on in the background across the street. There's also a man putting up signs for an event. Um, the first chapter of this, I realized this is the one of her books, I didn't read the synopsis, is about this woman in this relationship. Um, and then she finds out that her husband who died 
actually didn't die in the situation that he did and he's gonna like come back and now there's this love triangle. I know I've heard that plot before but I didn't realize this was the one that it was. Which makes sense when I look at the poster, I haven't seen the trailer but there is like two guys. So that one was intriguing enough. Um, the housemaid, I think it's intriguing but I don't know about the writing because there was a couple instances in the first chapter where you could surmise that the author like went to a thesaurus and just picked a word that was really similar to something else but sounded better but in reality didn't actually make sense so when Millie is interviewing for this position um, she goes to this really nice house and the lady Nina is talking about the job and talking about all the things she's gonna have to do and then she goes let's talk about your reimbursement and I think what she meant is like compensation like the money that you're gonna make because reimbursement means like paying back something but Millie didn't invest anything like it didn't cost her any money to get the interview. She also at one point let out the breath she didn't know she was holding so we've got some tropes. I'm readjusting my expectations but just this morning my friends Monet and Brie both did video experiments like reading a bunch of this author's work and I'm dying to watch them and I'm sure they won't spoil this but I really want to form my own opinion before I see those but I really want to go watch these right now. So because of that I am going to continue reading this one and we'll just see the vibe. So I got 150 pages in and I took an Ava Jules inspired photo. This book is definitely a fast read. I think it's what you'd classify as a popcorn thriller. It's just easy. I could see how somebody would describe it as fun. I think it's something that you like pick up in an airport and read on a plane, read on vacation. It's not that there's a lot of plot, but it feels really fast paced. It's so hard to imagine going into this position where you're supposed to be a maid. And then they say things like, oh, sometimes you have to provide childcare and sometimes you can cook us a meal, but then like every single night she's expected to do all of the things. But like that is the thing that's making this so challenging is she never really knows if she's doing the right thing. She never knows what's expected of her. At first she's supposed to be like part of the family and gets to hang out anywhere. And then sometimes when she is anywhere, she gets in trouble and is sent away. And she's having a challenging time with Nina the mother because she is very hot and cold. Her mental state, her mental illness perhaps, I don't know if I like how it's being spoken about, but because of the way that the author is delivering it to us, I am understanding that there's something else going on that we're not privy to yet. At the halfway point, it's going really in a different direction that I'm not enjoying, but I could see how this could be a really good transition for romance readers into mystery thriller books. I have finished The Housemaid. I'm giving it three stars. I really need like a five star in this video because I do not want to be labeled as a hater. The thrilling elements definitely picked up in the second half. All the mysteries got answered. There was an interesting final chapter that made sense now to me why there's a sequel. I can definitely see why people would be into this. I always say when I'm reading a thriller, I want to be entertained and surprised. Those two things didn't necessarily happen to the degree that they could. And I think there are a couple opportunities for recommendations within this video. If you care to know what I would suggest people read if they liked this one and they haven't read a lot of other mystery thriller books. I think a lot of books in these genres that I tend to pick up nowadays as I'm in my 30s is books about women in their 30s and perhaps what's appealing to younger people is following not necessarily younger but somebody who isn't established in specific careers or relationships who's either starting their adult life or starting over and in this one when she's getting involved in this marriage and like figuring out all of the inner workings of their life if that's appealing to you um Ruth Ware comes to mind so the turn of the key might be something that you like Shonora Williams I would say has a similar writing style and vibe I think I also gave this a three but if you liked that one you might like this one especially if you're looking to expand the authors you're reading from Amanda Jayatissa comes to mind if you are interested in like more POVs or more timelines you're invited is really good also I guess Luster comes to mind this isn't a mystery thriller but Raven Lalani is a great author and this is about a marriage and a younger woman they never learn might also appeal to you by Lane Fargo, a queer author writing about queer characters. This one is really intricate. Speaking of my friend Brie from earlier, I did catch up on the videos and it was very interesting seeing how our opinions uh, were similar and different. They read different books, but anyway. Brie runs a readathon in October called Black Aween or the Black Aweenathon, and it's all about um, supporting and reading black crime authors. So this would be a great time to expand your horizons. And I think Alyssa Cole would be someone great to read for that. Uh, when no one is watching, you might like. Um, Rachel Hazel Hall just in general, but they all fall down might appeal to you. This has Agatha Christie vibes. And now switching back over to nonfiction. Today I'm reading Brain Rules. 
Oh, and I'll be sipping on a sparkling ice that I found at the grocery store. I just feel like drink sponsorships are kind of the best ones to get. Like they make so much sense. So I'm gonna try this, I got the grapefruit. I was gonna do this drink, but again, I flopped. Um, the girls are just really into strawberries right now. And Melanie posted about getting, I think it was a chai with strawberry cold foam. But I think that's out of season now. As are the strawberries I picked up yesterday. Now I wish I could go to the south of France and grab those. We can't all be Emma Chamberlain. I just didn't know that certain fruits could be trendier than others, but right now everybody's just posting all about strawberries. Oh, hey, I like it more than I thought I would. Shout out to Summer for this one. I started this one already this morning because I really wanna get it done by the time I have reading sprints this evening with my channel members because I wanna be reading something more fun during those. Well, maybe not fun, but like just more interesting, I guess. But this is interesting. Our author here, Dr. John Medina, is a developmental molecular biologist. And what I'll say about this so far is it's not a very timeless book. It's specifically targeting the seniors currently and like what their experiences are like. The most interesting part to me so far was about risk assessment and how your brain changes as you get older and why seniors are a group most targeted by fraudulent people and scammers is because like your brain actually changes your ability to notice when something is trustworthy or not. So naturally the post that I got this from, this wasn't targeted at Hannah nor I as a book to read, but it can inform you about certain things about your own family and things that you can implement as you grow older. I have now finished my book. I definitely sped up the audiobook the last like two chapters that were specifically about um, sleep and retirement. There was quite a lengthy section about like how to get the right amount of sleep, how to figure out what the right amount of sleep is for you, and all of these tips and tricks that you could take away. So I got the general gist of it, but like I didn't need the tips, so I wasn't super paying attention. And then the concept of retirement and how it's actually so good for people to not completely stop everything that they're, they've are they known their entire life all of a sudden and how nostalgia is actually really good for you and regularly encountering things that you have done throughout your life. I'm just making myself a late lunch of sushi before Liam gets home. My favorite part of it was when it was talking about um, the importance of interacting with other age groups and other people with differing opinions and experiences as you. And how research shows that seniors have a longer lifespan and a better quality of life if they're interacting with children, toddlers, adults, and people their own age regularly. Obviously it makes sense when you surround yourself with like-minded individuals, you're going to continue your own belief system. There was a specific thing that he was talking about where it clicked for me that that also happens because you're literally training your brain and the biology of your brain is not allowing you to think effectively when you are not varying the amount of opinions and thoughts that are being introduced into your life. I also learned about more of the signs of Alzheimer's than just the obvious ones. And I feel like that was really beneficial to me. And that's about it. I finished my sushi. I don't know how to perfect like end pieces or if you're even supposed to, but most of them are pretty cute. All right, so I'm gonna go have this and start in on the Taylor Jenkins read. I'm about hundred pages in. I know that Taylor Jenkins Reid is just like a really popular author. Everyone loves her stuff. I read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and I gave it a three star. I thought it was just okay. I didn't really get the hype, but I also do not like books about famous people, which is why I never picked up D.G. Jones and the Six. But I'm 100 pages in and um, my heart, it hurts. I'm worried about this book. So we just saw our main character, Emma, fall in love with Jesse. We went back in time. We saw them in high school and how they originally met and got together. And I just like fell in love. I fell in love. <laughs> I love him. I love them. It was just, it was great. And then we just went through their whole love story and it ended so abruptly when he went off on a trip without her and he died. We already know that going in, obviously. And then there was a scene where she was so devastated, obviously. And she like read a book and somebody died. And then her parents, she was like, I walked into the room and my parents were reading a whole stack of books trying to find one where the characters didn't die so they could tell me to read it. <laughs> and I don't know why that's getting me, but like, oh my God, I don't think I'm prepared now to suddenly just that quick have to now follow the love story between her and Sam because obviously her and Jesse are meant to be but I know that she is going to convince me of both of them and that's fucked up. I'm sitting here like editing this video and I just keep picking up this book and reading a couple pages and putting it down. I can't take it. I'm 170 pages in now and the interaction that just happened like what the fuck do you 
do if you are this woman and you are in this situation? This is so stressful. Hello, my besties. Welcome to our evening sprints. I think we're gonna do three sprints, 30 minutes each with like 10 to 15 in between. We're gonna play some games. I'm currently reading One True Loves. I wanna hear what you're reading. I'm 100 pages from the end and this is like a love triangle book and I feel like at this point I know who the person's gonna be. Um, not that she has implied that, she's still very much questioning it, but I just feel like it's obvious to us who it's gonna be. Um, so I'm feeling less stressed. I'm still on live, but I finished my read. I think it was a really solid four star. Like I can pinpoint the exact things that I wish it had done differently. One of them is I think we should have spent more time in different places. There was a couple time jumps that I wasn't necessarily loving. And I think it's one of those books that expertly um, gives you a protagonist that you're not going to understand all of their decisions. Maybe some people aren't going to agree with so many things that she does, but that doesn't make it a good or a bad book. It just makes it a character that you can understand or you can't. She's complex. The situation is complex. Obviously there was tough decisions to make and we dealt a lot with grief in here, um, but a lot of things were also just convenient and just soft and loving like everybody was so supportive and that was good because it didn't make for this big dramatic story. I like a romance that's more rom-com. The ones that are really melancholy or angry I don't often love but this didn't feel like a romance to me necessarily. It felt like this woman's journey figuring out what she wanted but I do feel good about my four and I'm really excited to watch the movie. All right, it's been a couple days. I guess I need to update you on the movie before I talk about my next book. Uh, just didn't like it. That's all I need to say about it. I made my husband watch it with me, which I regret. It felt like a Hallmark movie. And I guess it's not just a Hallmark movie because they're trying to accomplish something specific within them, but I've never done a finished one. Anyway, that's my review. Didn't like it. I'm now reading The Razor's Edge and I'm halfway through. I've been reading this for two days and I still don't even know if I know how to tell you what this is or what the point is or if I'm even aware of what the plot is. We're kind of just meandering through this group of people. Um, we're direct to reader, which is very fun. The author is like, I'm telling this novel. Here's why I'm telling it. Here's this guy that I met. He's like regularly checking in with us. Like this might to not totally be true. I might have changed these facts around. And the synopsis, which I hadn't read until just now, talks a lot about this guy named Larry. Um, but I thought our main character w might be Elliot, but we are talking more and more about Larry as the book goes on. So he's just this guy in this wealthy family that's not so wealthy anymore, but they're still putting on a front to society. And I think what Larry embodies is the idea of going for your passions and your dreams, even if other people don't understand why. So he doesn't exist in a really traditional way. His job and his lifestyle and his wants and needs don't align with the rest of the people in here. Not the plot, but there's something about it that's really reminding me of reading um, Giovanni's Room. Maybe it's because I haven't read a whole ton of classics. Maybe there's something about the setting or the time period that it was written or set. I haven't made any connections, but I'm sure somebody could. There's something that feels familiar in there that makes me think if you liked this, I would probably recommend that one. The sun is now setting though. I had a beautiful day at the beach with my kid because he skipped school. <laughs> he had a little bit of a sniffle, um, but we do have to go to hockey tryouts now. So I'm gonna go do dinner. I'm gonna read this, do hockey, talk to you later. It turned out to be the perfect time to be reading this because Emma just did an interview with Marie Claire. And one of the first questions they asked is like, what is your most recent read? And she confirmed she hasn't finished a book in a year and she's currently reading Crime and Punishment and struggling through it. So now I feel really up to date. I think what I'm gonna give it is a 3.5. As the book went on, I enjoyed it more. We were very much focused on Larry and his life. And then we did switch over to Elliot. And I just think the contrast between those two people and the things that the book was talking about was interesting seeing those juxtaposed next to each other because there was even a portion that was talking about um, how you can never get rid of all of the evilness in the world and there has to exist bad things with good things and everything has to coexist. What I'll say is it has the language you might expect. Most of the women are described as fat. There's constant, every person they meet is like, that girl's fat. She has no like 
worth in my life because she's so fat and she's so ugly and that woman's a whore. And then any black folks mentioned, which is rare, um, but they are referred to by slurs. And Elliot as a character that our author is witnessing is talking about his obsession with dinner parties and his perception. And Larry, he just goes off and does whatever feels right for him. And there was a whole section about him um, living with monks and all the things that he gained from that. It's just adults navigating life. And so if you liked this and you want something more modern um, that is adults navigating life. And there is also conversations about class and um, equality and acceptance. I would say Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I kind of want to reach for Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows by Bali Jaswal. Though these are so different than the classic one is a pretty funny book, but there is like an author who is doing a writing class. And obviously we're following like the building of a book within this and her just trying to figure out like where she belongs in society. Those are just the two that came to mind because uh, I don't think I read a lot of this style of book. And I'm moving swiftly along to this one. This is Letter to My Younger Self. It's from The Big Issue, which is a magazine that regularly published these little interviews um, for celebrities and public figures. And now it's been combined into this book. And every person I'm this far in seems to have taken it in a different kind of way. Some of them focus specifically on themselves and give a very clear anecdote from their teenage years where they said, I wish I had done this instead of this. And then on the other hand, a good amount of them are saying, yes, it's still an anecdote and it's still about themselves, but it does feel a little more broad and having awareness that like this is meant to be advice for teens or young people who are currently reading it. For example, we heard from Billie Jean King and she had something specific to say about her own experience, but then left it with this really hope-filled note about youths of today and how they or we have the opportunity to really change things and be so much more inclusive than ever. And then Mel C from the Spice Girls was talking about how she was kind of unlikable in school because she had this huge passion to be a performer and she couldn't relate to anyone around her. And so she was kind of insufferable, but she finds that that is something that she needed. And perhaps that's how she got to where she was because she had this attitude. Then I've read a couple that were just very specific, like, oh, I wish I hadn't spoken to this person when I did. I don't think this is gonna be life-changing in any way. Maybe it would have been if I read it when I was much younger. And so I will tell you by the end if I think it's worth you picking up. Hello, I've changed into my clay working apparel so I don't get it all over my decent clothes. I think I'm gonna read the second half of this via audio because I did see that there's an audiobook and I wanna work on a tic-tac-toe board. I'm gonna make it shaped like a strawberry. I don't know if I'll be done with it by the time this video is over, but I'm gonna start working on it. So I tapped all of the authors in here that I'd heard of because I was just interested. And it turns out that I have heard of 36 of the 100 people who are offering their advice or their thoughts or whatever. And that's better than I thought I would do because I feel like I'm very not in celebrity culture. A lot of them, as expected, hammer home the same kind of point. And I was reading them out of order because I figured the way that Hannah might have been doing this. And when you go to like a vacation spot and you see like a coffee table book that's about a hundred celebrities, you're probably just gonna flip through it and read the ones from the celebrities that you're familiar with. Cause no one is really reading this front to back in one day. Like that's not normal, Kayla. I would say the number one takeaways are like, I wish I'd spend more time with my family. I wish I'd appreciated what I had in the moment. And then quite a few of them don't really seem to fit the theme. They're just talking about um, how much they enjoyed their youth and they miss it. My favorite one was from Joanna Lumley. She said, I would tell my younger self that one is powerless until one decides to be powerful. Um, and then she was talking about how she is just a celebrity and she's she considers herself an unskilled person. And she says, when you're unskilled like me, but have a kind of fame, you can use it to attract the oxygen of publicity towards something that will make people's lives better. This is a great privilege I try to use responsibly. I'm gonna do the audiobook for the second half and I'll see you in a second.
right, while my East of Eden audiobook takes 24 hours to download, I'll tell you, I didn't love the audiobook of this one. I think it was just a little unnatural um, reading from like 50 cents perspective of his childhood from a man with a British accent. <laughs> there was two narrators, I appreciate it, but I didn't love it. And then it also didn't totally match up. There were some things in here that weren't in there and some things in the audiobook that weren't in here. So they must have been put out at different times. Um, I don't think I really gained anything from the second half of this. My strawberry is currently drying. We'll paint her tomorrow. I wrote down a note for every single one about what the takeaway message was. Most of them just had to do with living in the moment and being your authentic self. I would say if you see this on sale somewhere, like go ahead and pick it up, but it's not something you at any age need. So now we're moving on to East of Eden. And can I tell you something? I don't know what East of Eden is. I have no idea. Um, I know it's a retelling of the book of Genesis. Obviously Eden is a reference, I understand. But other than that, no clue, no clue at all. My download is Done. The Salinas Valley is in Northern California. It's a long, narrow swale between two ranges of mountains. Okay, so last night I got to chapter eight, um, which has me at 15% of the way through the audiobook. We're following these two brothers so far, Charles and Adam, and they seem very different. One of them um, is like running a farm and one of them went off into the army and their father just died and they're coming back together and I don't know what's gonna happen from here. So we're following them, but then we're also following um, this young girl named Kathy who just got assaulted by these boys. We just got set up with so many characters from the beginning. There was like this family with a whole bunch of boys and then they, I was just getting to understand who was who and then there was a whole bunch of daughters and I had to get to know all of them. But at this point there was just a house that burned down and we don't know if people survived. I don't know what's a spoiler and what's not of like who was involved and who was responsible. Because I have no clue anything about this, like I don't know what to tell you or what to keep from you or what even I'm supposed to care about. It is definitely accessible. It's easy to understand. Um, some classics, the language is like tough to get into. I'm reading this with ease and hopefully I will get through a significant chunk of it here today. This morning, it's actually already like late afternoon. It was a hockey day. Liam is in the final rounds of um, cuts to get on the hockey team. But now I'm ready to hunker down and get through this. It's midnight. Here are my life updates. I'm very tired. I successfully painted my strawberries and leaves for my tic-tac-toe board, which it might not look like it, but I spent like an hour and a half on all of these. So that got me through a good amount of my audiobook. And then we had hockey tryouts and Liam made the next cut. So tomorrow is the final day. I don't know if I should be impressed or horrified with how much I got through, but I am on page 429 now and I'm paying attention. Like sometimes, especially in longer audiobooks or classics, like you could find yourself zoning out or I could. Not in this one, my friend. I'm reading this as if it is a book club pick, as if I need to have a discussion about it after. Mostly it started because I wanted to keep track of everybody's names and who was who, because we do get introduced in the synopsis by the idea that there's intertwined destinies of two families, the Trasks and the Hamiltons, one of which we are deeply following and one of which we're not so much, but it's followed those two brothers and now we're following descendants. There has been death, there has been um, birth, and now there's a set of twins and we're following their journey and their relationship with parents and learning the truth about their parents. And I'll tell you alongside the razor's edge, like I'm not having a great time language wise. Like I just don't want to be reading bigotry and everything going on in here, but the story itself, I am so intrigued by, and I can't really explain why, but I think the characters are really vividly drawn and I have no idea where the story's going, but I can't stop reading. Actually, I can't stop reading because occasionally I will turn off the audiobook and I'll read physically because I remembered I have more essays to read. So we'll see if both of these get finished by tomorrow. I don't think anybody could have expected East of Eden to be my highest rated book of this video, um, but I'm putting it in the fours. I don't know if it's a 4.25 or something more specific than that, but I just had a really interesting time and I think there's always something fun about reading classics at the end of the day because you get to look up so many things after. Like there have been so many opinion pieces about every piece of well-loved and hated literature. And so of course I had to look into the story of 
Cain and Abel and about John Steinbeck's own family, family history, because some of it is based off of biblical things and some of the families are, one of the families is based off of his own. The conversations around good and evil and creating the life that you want and all of these family dynamics, it really is just this large generational experience. You're following them through so many different years. I wouldn't even call it a family drama. It just is. It's just life. It's how these boys were set up to have the experience that they're going to and how different people deal with different pressures and different opportunities. I wouldn't say if you're like a hater of classics, this isn't one of the ones that I would say you have to go back and read. It does something incredible. It really is just appreciating the way that this story is told and the language involved. There's a lot of quotes you could people have pulled out of here that are stunning. I've got just a little bit of time before hockey today. And so I'm gonna finish the essay collection, which I'm actually quite enjoying. I started off not really connecting with it, but I think it's got a really good balance of things to say for people who are actively struggling, for people who feel like their lives are just fine. There's lists of like things to look out for in the future. Here's how you know you're going down the wrong path in this certain sense. I'm sometimes resistant to self-help and it's not so much the books themselves, but it's the idea that I think especially women in our society are so encouraged to constantly be working towards something and that you're never good enough and you should constantly be picking up these books about how to improve your productivity and mindset and all of this stuff that I'm sure is valuable to so many people. But in the same way that if I heard somebody only read fiction, I would encourage them to sometimes pick up nonfiction because it can be more beneficial than maybe they assume. I would also say the same thing to people who exclusively read nonfiction and self-improvement, that there is so much joy in reading for fun and that you should really work towards finding what genre you might love. And you don't always have to pick up a book just to learn something. We are back from hockey. Liam made the team. Or at least it seems like he made the team. He's been invited to the practices this week, which include morning practices. And there might be one more cut on Thursday after practice, but it's not gonna be a defense probably. So we are in celebration mode. And I finished this. I will say there was a couple that I skipped because the titles themselves very clearly lay out who they're for. Like the one I just flipped to, 10 questions to ask yourself when you don't know where your life should go next. That's not me. 30 questions you need to ask yourself if you still haven't found the relationship you want. Then there's ones that don't feel like they're for me, but they could be someday like why we subconsciously love to create problems for ourselves. Like, I don't know what my future holds, but I thought this one was really interesting because it talked about how people subconsciously create issues. So they like have something to do and something to solve. And obviously that's not true for everybody and not everything is going to apply to everybody. And there are some things and some wording that felt weird to me, but in general, I think this was good. If there was two in here that I could recommend everybody read and start with, one would be how to know you've evolved more than you give yourself credit for. So this is great because this thing is packed full of a lot of advice, but there is also a lot of moments where she's saying, look at your life and be happy with what you have. And here's some pointed questions to think about regarding how far you've come. And maybe you don't even realize that you've been on this journey and you've accomplished so many more things than you think because you're always working for some kind of goal. I also think that eight cognitive biases that are creating the way you experience your life is gonna be really valuable for a lot of people. It's short and it just explains these different biases like anchoring, which is we become too influenced by the first piece of information we hear which is so true when you're learning about something for the first time. Sometimes you don't feel motivated to look up more information if the first piece of info you find feels right. It explained confirmation bias, which is probably the most common bias she says that people are familiar with. And then there was one all about negativity and how sometimes you are unfortunately seeking that out. There's a lot of nonfiction that I do love that doesn't feel like self-help. It feels more how you can improve the world around you more so than just yourself. But obviously these do involve changing how you act in the world. So speaking of biases, I always recommend to people biased uncovering the hidden prejudice that shapes what we see, think, and do by Jennifer L. Everhart, PhD. And then Hood Feminism is the one that I recommend all the time by Mickey Kendall, notes from the women that a movement forgot. And then if you do like coffee table books, this series, the first one was Here We Are, 44 Voices Write, Draw, and Speak on Feminism in the Real World. Don't Call Me Crazy, which is all about mental health and body talk, which is all about like radical body acceptance or body neutrality. And these are 
are really fun to look at if that's your kind of thing. Last time I did the Visco Girl video, my favorite, my only five star of it was Eating Animals, which is another nonfiction that's more about the world around us. And unfortunately, this time around, even though I read twice the amount of books as last time, I did not end up with a five star here, but I didn't hate very much of what I read. My least favorites ended up being these two, which I probably would have told you, like I would have guessed might have been my favorites by the end. I had some mostly three star ones that I felt good about and I could find myself recommending to certain groups of people. Then the nonfictions that I appreciated the most and could find myself recommending pretty broadly. And my two most unexpected favorites, though not five stars, these ones. Like I think I said at the beginning, this is just supposed to be a fun experiment, just a way to build a TBR, which I do all the time. It's not a commentary on anyone or anything that people are reading, but I hope you left this with some information about books and my enjoyment of them and with some recommendations. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!